So the journey continues. We've shown you the scale of the events. We've shown you the energy of the fans. Now it's time to show you just how world-class Octagon MMA fighters are. If you love MMA, stay tuned. This is Octagon Hype. So welcome back. This is episode two of Octagon Hype. My name is Brian Lacey and this is the show that lifts the lid on the world's fastest growing mixed martial arts promotion, Octagon MMA. Now, before we start episode two, I've got to say a huge thank you to every single one of you that tuned in, watched, shared, liked, subscribed to the last episode, episode one of Octagon Hype. Could not have been happier with the response for that. So thank you to every single one of you. Now, uh, I know one episode is not going to change the world. It's not going to change everybody's feelings towards Octagon MMA but my litmus test my my bar for how we are doing on this show is my producer Mr. Josh Goodgen. Now Josh has one episode of Octagon Hype changed you in any way? <laughs> All right you could you could take it off now mate you could take it off. Yeah I, I can't be wearing this every, <laughs> I can't wear this every episode. <laughs> I just love that as well, because sometimes those caps, the flat ones, don't suit everybody. But my goodness, mate, if Octagon are looking for a new model, I think they found it in Josh Goodgen there. Sign me up. I didn't expect to be a co-host of this event with you, but here I am. <laughs> well, there you go. well, this is the other thing as well, Josh, because a lot of the comments I got were about you saying how much they liked you, how much they liked your energy, how much they liked you being on the show. So what I have to do, because no one said that about <laughs> me, is I'm going to make your box smaller in the That's corner. Fine. That's fine. You're getting rigid. <laughs> Forget it. Bring it back. Bring it back. Um, but look, Josh, the response was fantastic. Now, there's one tweet I want to share with you in particular. Now, we got lots of um, people message us from in and around the world of mixed martial arts. We had journalists, pr promoters, other fighters sharing the podcast, uh, liking uh, the, the, uh, the channel. Um, but this guy, this guy, Ariel Hawani, said this about Octagon MMA. Look, he tweeted that off the back of, back of Scott Langdon's tweet. Keep your eyes on Octagon Official. They are doing great things in Europe and building some serious momentum. Look at that, Josh. That is the highest praise. That is, that's up there, isn't it? That is, he's been around the block. He's been, he's been around the block. But I don't want to say, look, I don't want to say that, look, Octagon Hype dropped on Sunday and he tweeted this on Monday. So I don't, you know, oh. want to say it's a coincidence, but maybe he might have been one of those thousands of people that choose into episode one. What do you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Check your DMs. He might be in the request. He might have been my, messaging my, you. My DMs are a scary place, my friend. <laughs> my DMs are a scary place. So look, um, we have also got to say thank you to our guests last week, Pavel Neruda uh, and also Carlos Vermola. We should congratulate Carlos Vermola as well, Josh. He got married this week. Uh, finally, that marriage happened. Him and Layla, she married a champion. We congratulate them we'll see the wedding photos there there's them looking beautiful um now uh, of course it wouldn't be a vermola wedding without some animal action so here we have him and his best man it, it's <laughs> got a the monkey's got a suit on <laughs> <laughs> it looks, looks good. Listen, well, once again, uh, congratulations to Carlos Vermola, the light heavyweight champion, and Mrs. Vermola now as well. So there we go. Um, so look, last week I introduced you to the scale of the events. Last week, Josh, I showed you just how big the events are, the quality of the production, uh, the atmosphere within the crowd. Now, this episode, what I really want to do is I want to introduce you to some of the fighters, not just the fighters, but the champions of Octagon MMA. So this week, week we're going to break down some of the the champions their roads to the title on top of that we're going to talk to two-time UFC heavyweight champion Frank Mir who uh, called the fight of Lausanne Cater when he claimed that belt at Octagon 33 in Frankfurt and then we will also talk to the none other than the shark Jonas Magard the 135 pound the bantam weight champion that's what we got in store for you today Josh what do you think yeah I'm excited I'm excited Frank Mir that, that again some more high praise these are some absolutely absolute goats of MMA out there really. Legends of the game, legends in the making and uh, legends on the mic, shall we say that? Are we allowed? Absolutely. Yeah. Why not? So here we have the current champions uh, of Octagon MMA. Look at there, Teresa Bladar, the flyweight champion, five and oh, this young lady, I think she's only 22 years of age, undefeated in uh, amateur MMA, undefeated in professional MMA, claimed that inaugural flyweight title and it will be a name that you will know for years to come, an absolute star 
are in the making. Following that, we have the bantamweight champion Jonas Magard, who we'll be highlighting later. Ivan Buki Buckinger, uh, a legend of the game, somebody who has been in and around the sport, claimed titles all over the world and the current 145-pound champion. Lozen Keita is our 155-pound champion. And Josh, I'm looking forward to showing you some of the uh, highlights of the action he has delivered in the cage so far with Octagon MMA. Then on to David Cosma, the welterweight champion, the longest reigning Octagon champion. Then we have Patrick Kinsella, at middleweight. And we spoke to Carlos Vimola last week, the newly crowned light heavyweight champion. If we jump to the next graphic, that is their form over the last five fights. So there we have the reigning defending Octagon MMA champions, an absolute row of killers. And I'm going to introduce you to them one by one. First of all, we're going to start with Lozen Kater. Now, Josh, I want you to throw up the highlights from Lozen Kater. This is a guy undefeated. He's 9-0. Oh. He's only been with Octagon MMA for seven months. He started his journey, Octagon 29. That was back in December of 2021 where he took on Carol Rishavi. Now, Rishavi is a fighter that has already got nine fights in Octagon, was on a two-fight win streak. He's an absolute monster. Lozen Kieta did this to him. So what I love about that performance, Josh, what I absolutely love, and I want you to jump to this now, is the first exchange in that fight. Now, Lozan Keita is coming into enemy territory. He's coming up against already what is a star in Octagon MMA. But for me, what laid out what was going to happen in that fight was this first exchange. So just look at that first exchange. It's not just about what he throws, it's how he throws it, the intent. He's not intimidated at all by Carol Rashavi, by the moment, by the crowd, uh, by the big lights of Octagon MMA. He steps out there and he puts it on Carol Rashavi from the start and he does what not many people have ever been able to do to the, a fighter of that level and he finishes him within one round. That was his debut, Josh. That's unbelievable. Like He's committed to every shot that he's throwing, his, foot, his hand speed and his footwork combined look just another level like that is an unbelievable performance that's no that's no respect there just coming out swinging <laughs> good com- man it comes out but this is the other side of it right so that he was seven and i know in that fight carol rishavi had twice the amount of fights wow. twice the amount of fights twice the amount of experience he stepped into that cage already nine times for octagon mma more than all the fights that uh, kieta has had as a professional yet kieta put on a performance like that So that performance earned him the interim title shot. So two fights into his octagon journey and he's fighting Ronald Paradisa for the interim lightweight belt. Now, Ronald Paradisa has got 13 more professional fights than Lozan Keita. He is already, again, an established star in octagon MMA. But just watch the walkout to start with, Josh. Just watch Keita's walkout because in one fight, In one fight, he built this sort of following, a following which was on its feet for when he made the walk to the cage, a crowd which, even though he's in Ronald Paradis's backyard, uh, he had a huge amount of support in that audience for that fight. How good do these events look? Like I'm proper, <laughs> ju- I, I need to I need to experience one of these events. We have to get you there, Josh. We have to get I you to, to one of it. these events to see it in person because it, seeing it on the screen is one thing. Feeling it live is unlike anything else you can experience in the world of mixed martial arts and events across the board because the energy of the crowd feeds into the fights and you could feel it. So for this fight, he fought Ronald Paradisa. Paradisa, again, one of the most experienced, but for me, also one of the most intelligent fighters on the Octagon roster and Keita did this to him. Over three rounds, he established not just his striking, dominated on the ground and if you look at the end of this fight, if you look at the face of Ronald Paradisa, I mean, you jump back to any of his fights. Not many fighters, if any, have ever dished out that sort of damage to a fighter of his caliber. Kieta, on his second fight with Octagon, not only took the decision, not only got his hand raised, but in two fights claimed the interim belt at the 155 bracket. He looks the part, but also, Josh, this is the thing that when you look at a total package for a fighter, when you're looking at that superstar um, ingredient, he's got everything because his fighting style is great. He looks great. 
but he also he can talk. Now his next fight would be the unification bout at Octagon 33, the debut event in Frankfurt against Ivan Buki Buckinger. Now before this fight, they built it up with a press conference in Ostrava. Now, Josh, I've shown you the events. The press conference, right? The press conference had 2,000 people in attendance. <laughs> so within eight fights, within eight fights, Keita has walked out in front of, uh, first of all, beat Carol Rishavi, then walked out in front of 15,000 people and claimed the interim title. He's now doing a press conference in front of 2,000 people and he held his own. Some people crumble in front of the mic. This guy, this guy was, gave as good as he got. Let's have a little listen. Brother, every fight st start on stand-up, you know? First, you must get me on the ground. I am not your brother. You must get me on the ground, brother. <laughs> Listen, if you want, we do two titles, 66. Again, also, no problem. No problem, brother. No problem, brother. <laughs> <laughs> so look, he's in the press conference no in front of what is an Ivan booking a friendly crowd. And he's not only calling for the 155 belt, but he's now wanting the champ champs both belts, the 145 <laughs> and the 155. Now, Josh, when you look at fighters, and we, we, we watch a lot of fights, we, we're around a lot of people and personalities in MMA, there is that X factor with some of them, right? There is that when you, you get them, you kind of get it. You get why they've got a following. You get why they get so much hype. With Lozan Keita, it's not just when you see him fight, but when you feel his presence, there's something special there. That's the difference as well, isn't it? You've got those that try to give the chat, try to have the talk, but they're not necessarily backs it up. He's already proved himself in the cage. They've gone out there, gone to the press conference, held his own. If I was in the opponent's shoes, I'd be worried, you know? This is this is in the mind. Well, look at the opponent. So Ivan Booking Bookinger. He had thirty-eight more professional fights stepping into that title fight with uh Kieta than Lozen Kieta. He was a pro from two thousand and seven, Ivan Bookinger. Lozen Kieta did not turn professional, did not have a, a professional MMA fight until twenty nineteen, Josh. Twenty nineteen. Now all the odds makers. All the bookies, all the talk on the build-up to this fight with the experience of Ivan Buckinger, on top of the fact that he is an elite grappler, multiple submissions on his record would mean he would take Keita down and everybody thought he would submit Keita. The odds were in his favour, the crowd were behind him and then Lozen Keita at Octagon 33 in Frankfurt in one round did this. And again, Josh, it's when you look not just at the way he fights, but his commitment in the cage, his confidence, and he oozed it, his speed, his footwork. And from really early on, I think it was a right hand that caught Buckinger early on against the cage. Buckinger then started to do stuff uncharacteristic. He was shooting from a long way out, and Lozan Keita capitalized on that in emphatic fashion. They called it in the press, didn't they? He said, it all starts on the feet. Everything starts on the feet. And this is why Lozan Keita is so dangerous. It's not just his striking, it's his footwork, it's his takedown defense, it's his reflexes, it's his will to be in the fire in the midst of a fight. He's not scared. You look at the Rishavi uh, first exchange, he steps into the war. You look at the battle he has with Ronald Paradisa, he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of the best fighters on the planet. Then he came up against somebody who everybody thought was going to take him down and make it look easy. He was not phased at all, one single moment in that fight, and that's what claimed him the belt. That's what got it wrapped around his waist and he was emotional when he got the interim belt but there was confidence there was like this belongs to me when he got the belt wrapped around him by Pavel Neruda at Octagon 33. Yeah and look at the crowd like everyone's behind him as well. That's the other thing Josh he brings an army with him he brings an army so the first fight with Rishavi there was still lockdown restrictions yet still 30-40 of his fans traveled from Belgium and came and watched him fight there. Ronald Paradiso, he walked out there and you look at the walkout, you look at how many fans are on the side of Lozen Kieta. Then in Frankfurt, Germany, the party crew, the Lozen Kieta crew were in full effect. And when he got the title, when he got the belt wrapped around his waist, those scenes beside the cage, they again are something for me that says we've got a star on yeah. our hands. We've got somebody that is building a following, somebody that has people behind him, but that is backing up every single thing with the performances he puts on in the cage. He's nine fights, nine fights into his professional career and he looks that good. It's a star shining bright, is that, isn't it? That is something special. And somebody who got to witness that with me and call that fight is a pretty big star in his own right in the world of mixed martial arts. Some would say a legend, Josh. Uh, my friend, Mr. Frank Mir, and I'm going to speak to him now.
So here we are joined by the legend himself, Mr. Frank Mayer. Firstly, Frank, uh, thank you for doing this. It's like 8.30 in the morning in Vegas, right? Yeah, but the kids are first week back to school, so I got to start getting up early again. <laughs> so don't blame me then. I'm, I'm off the hook for this one, right? Actually, I got to sleep in a little bit today from yesterday because of doing this so worked out. Oh, there we go. I appreciate it. Now, Frank, um, we got you on because you got to come to Frankfurt with us. You commentated the Octagon 33. Um, we've just been watching highlights from Lowe's and Cater. So Cater took on Ivan Buckinger in that that fight. Came in the huge underdog, but super. you were super impressed with what he did in the cage. Yeah, it was very, uh, you know, you can train an athlete to follow a game plan, but usually the least experienced they are, the harder it is for them to do so. Things happen in the fight. They panic. They revert back to things that they feel comfortable with. And, uh, you know, he stuck to his game plan. He was very smooth, uh, you know, knew that he had to stop the shot. And then even when he, he landed a couple of uh, strikes early on, he didn't get carried away. He didn't get greedy. He was able to uh, sit there and stay composed, which for somebody with his level of experience, I was actually extremely impressed with. Obviously, he's extremely talented. But to keep to that mindset, uh, you know, that's not easy to do when you only had a handful of fights, especially fighting somebody who has 30 more fights than you have. That's just, that's actually pretty almost one-sided. It's almost, uh, you know, fights like that almost might not be made, you know, at times commissions could have issues with it because of how uh, one-sided that could possibly be. Uh, when you look at fighters like that, and we've been lucky enough to travel the world, we've commentated on fights, been cage side, uh, to see some huge talent. But when you look at, Kata, how good do you think he is? Like, he's our champion. What's his potential? Oh, I mean, I think the sky's the limit. I mean, you know, obviously, look, uh, you could train as hard as you want and, and, and do all the things in the gym, but if you don't have the abilities as a good athlete, then that's really, I think, what the world is seeing now, that, you know, there, there's usually the old stigma that, you know, that no matter what, you can gain it by training. And I'm like, mm, no, I'm sorry. There's, if genetically you don't have the genes, you're never going to be a professional football player. If, you know, if you don't have the genes, you, you know, no matter how hard you try, you can't play basketball in the NBA. And, uh, you know, and fighting's becoming that way, too. It, it wasn't that way before because I think people saw Hoist Gracie. They're like, oh, this little skinny guy is not a good athlete. I'm like, well, yeah, because no one else knew what they were doing. And now that knowledge is so, you know, abundant, you know, I mean, hell, people can don't even have to join a gym nowadays. They can just turn on YouTube and learn how to fight. Um, now it's coming down to also athleticism and, and, and what kind of athlete you are. So he definitely checks that box off. And then the next one is just the mental aspect of it. You know, uh, you know, the fact that he can stay composed under a stressful situation where, you know, a lot of people could probably be patting the kid on the back going, hey, man, you know, I think at the time, what did he have, seven or eight fights at that moment? You yeah, know? it's an eight and oh at that point, yeah. Oh, right. Sit there and go, hey, look, you're fighting a guy who has, you know, 40 fights. He's fought for titles. He has belts. You know, uh, you know, this is your first go. Just make a good showing of yourself, you know, almost kind of a defeatist type mindset, which could almost really be seen as acceptable. If you're in his corner, you're going, hey, man, you know, just go out there and look good and let the chips fly. You know, you're young. You're going to, you know, but for him to go out there and go, no, I'm going to dominate this and I'm going to win and I'm going to be the champ. Uh, that shows also a mindset that, you know, and I hate saying that because I feel like almost anything can be trained for mentally, but but uh, it's difficult, you know. And so the fact that he has that, you know, already in the in, in his uh, back pocket, that mental foresight, uh, you know, the mental fortitude to uh, to be able to uh, overcome those type of scenarios, that's uh, impressive. I mean, now you know, I don't know how good he could possibly be, you know. That was your first taste of Octagon. Now, I'd talked to you a little bit about it and you'd seen stuff on social media, but the first time that you, you got there, how, did, how was that as an experience? What did you take away from, uh, from the promotion? Oh, extremely professionally ran. I was, I was, you know, I mean, I, you know, we both run around, do so many shows and, and, you know, I've been a part of some stuff that's just like, wow, this is, you know, all right, we'll make do, we'll figure this out, you know? <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, and a lot of times I look at it as a, a a test, you know, but, um, but this situation was far from that, you know, uh, it was definitely, you know, everything ran smoothly, was very professional, you know, the way they dealt with the fighters, us, everything from uh, A to Z, it was well put together. I, I talked to you as well about the, the promos they do for the fighters, because you've been around the big shows, you've been around shows that, um, and so you've been in some of the biggest fights as well. 
it's so important to tell the story right. And you now have Bella coming through. Bella May, your daughter, who is already undefeated as, as a mixed martial artist and, and on her own journey now alongside uh, the legacy that she's uh, sort of building on the, uh, with the mere name. The game's changed massively, right? And part of it is getting your story out there, being good on the mic, not just fighting well as well. And Octagon, like I said, I showed you some of the promos they did for some of the fighters on the build-up to this one. For me, it's it's the storytelling as well, and that's that's a, a, a big, important part that some promotions miss. Absolutely. I mean, when I came up with the UFC... Our issue is just trying to get people to want to watch the show itself. It wasn't really so much selling the fighters, but selling the show. Uh, you know, we had you know been banned, you know, here in the U.S. And just got back onto pay per view. So you know, I remember running around to uh, call centers where people, you know, to to help the people that you know when when you call in for pay per view buy, you would want to get friendly with those individuals and do showings there because that way they can say, hey, if you're ordering the boxing match, you are you aware that in two weeks there's a UFC fight and try to help you know motivate them to upsell and. Um, it was just, you know, the same questions all over again, you know, how, so are the rules? I mean, what do you, <laughs> and so it's interesting to see like now that it's moved so much far beyond that, that everybody now knows what MMA fighting is, you know, you, you know, and so, you know, it'd be far stretched for me to find somebody who's never heard of it and under, has an understanding of it. So now I think people can finally get interested in the sport, the, 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 the athletes themselves. And I think that's extremely important. I mean, People, you know, don't fill up an arena because in, in combat sports because of any other reason, but that they're, they're attached to certain fighters. That's what boxing does. You know, in boxing, if you have Canelo, I mean, he sells out because people want to see him fight. They're connected to him. And, uh, you know, they're not really going because of promotion. You know, uh, I think that has its limits. And I think that uh, the Octagon has it figured out correctly that you have to have people interested in certain guys and have the story and have any kind of a, you know an attachment to them to want to watch them go out there and fight and root for them. Um, it's not like you know team sports where you know guys go well if you're a fan of Chelsea whoever they put it forward you're going to follow. It's like fighting's not that way. You have to be able to be into the person themselves to really want to go to the show. You know when people say hey there's a fight. You know, you don't sit there and go, oh, I, you know, you know, I want to go see the fights. I mean, that still happens. But I think the biggest draw is when someone goes, oh, you know, so-and-so is fighting. I want to go watch him and I want to her and, and watch them compete. So I think now, you know, the, the, the shows are getting smarter about that. And Octagon doing the reality shows leading up, I think it's genius. I think that that's one of the greatest ways to really get someone attached to and get to know in a short amount of time fighters. There's another fighter on that card that I want to talk to you about for a couple of reasons. Carlos Vermola, the Terminator. Um, yeah. He stepped back in off his injury. So I think it was uh, 2021, so December, November, he got told basically through an elbow injury, he wouldn't fight again or he shouldn't fight again. That was the sentence. The injury would mean he can't hit, uh, do high impact stuff with his arm. Uh, his grappling would basically be... Um, debilitated because of the injury and they said MMA isn't an option really then since then he fought in boxing in uh, Prague in front of 20,000 people then he fought in Frankfurt say again was it like three or four weeks before the show too yeah that's right three or four weeks is just three weeks before three weeks before he fought in boxing uh, in front of 20,000 fans then he came to Frankfurt and he beat the uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt Pashtanak by head and arm choke in front of us and claimed that victory just a couple of weeks ago, Frank, he fought again. He fought again for the light heavyweight title, which he won against a guy, a guy called Alexander Illich, again by head and arm choke in the very first round. Off the back of that, Frank, he has now said before the end of the year, he would like to fight for the middleweight title. So go down to fight for the middleweight title. And then he wants to go up and fight Hatif Moel, who we also saw fight the, uh, the, the big German heavyweight uh, with Iranian descent. Uh, he wants to fight him as well. This is a guy that was told he will never or should never fight again. I know you've been through injuries. Your your uh, nasty break of the leg, which again should have ended the career, right? I mean, when you look at that as as most average human beings, when you see somebody like that and you see what he's doing, especially fighting in nine weeks, three fights, claiming one title, and then calling his shot for going down a weight and up a weight. What, what do you think of a fighter like that? You've witnessed him fight live. What are your thoughts on Vermola? Well, I think that Vermola definitely has an advantage because 
I think the problem is that, that most guys have, or, or women in this sport, is you think it's going to last forever. When you're sitting there fighting, you don't think that, oh, okay, this is going to come to an end. And, and you'll say it psychologically or, you know, mentally you'll be like, oh, yeah, no, I, I understand that, you know, in 20 years I'm not going to be fighting anymore. But they don't know what that feels like. So I don't think they cherish the moment to be able to go out there and compete. And I think that Vimolo, with his injury, probably stared down the barrel of what was going to be the end of his career and thought that he had been taken away from him. And so now that he's able to go out there and perform, and um, he now cherishes it. And I think you're seeing a guy out there who's trying to take advantage of every moment that he possibly can because he realizes that this isn't going to last forever. And so I, you see a guy out there that really is just cherishing the moment and pushing hard and you know, because he knows that at one time this is going to end. He's already felt what that feels like. He's felt that, you know, that horrible nightmare of like, all right, it's done. Lights, hang up the gloves. You're just a trainer now. You're just a coach. And so uh, I think the advantage he has is that he hates that feeling, and that's why he keeps on taking on challenges that most people would probably think are crazy. Um, one other guy I want to talk to you about is uh, somebody that when you were doing the seminar run over in the UK, um, he was your driver. He was basically a guy at the gym that got roped into, uh, and I say roped, he put his hand up and said, do I get to go and do seminars with Frank Mir? I mean, it's a dream for, for this guy. A guy called Jonas Magard, okay? A cheeky little Danish blonde dude that um, is now the Octagon uh, Bantamweight champion. You've watched him from that moment he was helping you in the seminars you've been around him been around Carl Prince seen him train what do you think about him and, and the progression he's made to now taking a, a big world championship belt in octagon yeah I think as long as Jonas doesn't get distracted with anything I think he's going to be uh, have a great career I think that he's extremely technical very smart puts in the hard work and also he has what a lot of guys sometimes in our sport just still can't figure out is to be charismatic uh, they have to be interesting to, on camera. And Jonas is, uh, he, you know, he knows how to be charismatic. He's interesting to watch and talk. And, you know, all those times I haven't seen him. Uh, I saw him there. He's sitting there. He's talking for 15 minutes. I'm thinking, this guy has, I mean, he really does. He knows how to be personable. He knows how to have personality. He makes himself interesting uh, of an individual that you're intrigued to go ahead and watch. And even to the point where maybe if you don't like him, he, you know, his, 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 his confidence can make it to where I want to watch this kid get his ass kicked, you know? And, um, that is an important quality to have in our sport that people just sometimes, uh, it drives me nuts. Like guys in the gym go, man, I'm, I'm 20. No, how come I'm not getting paid What that guy gets paid? I'm like, well, he, here it goes. Um, when you're on pay-per-view, uh, 10,000 people want to watch when he's on pay-per-view, a hundred thousand people want to watch. You know what I mean? I can only pay you on what I make when I sell tickets. Regardless if you think you're a better fighter, regardless of what it really comes down to, when it comes down to your pay, it comes down to, are you interesting? What can I sell? If I sell tickets with you, then you get paid a lot. And uh, I think Jonas not only has uh, the ability to fight, I mean, hell, he, has a, he showed me a move, a Japanese necktie. You know, I was like, wow, that is viciously tight and powerful. Like, I still sometimes tell the story about it. I'm like, I'm glad he actually showed me the move and didn't just throw it on me because he absolutely would have caught me with it. You know what I mean? Because it's not the most orthodox move the guys hit from uh, the top of a half guard. He, um, he, he blames us for something, though, Frank. He has a little bit of beef with me and you, all right, about this Japanese necktie because... And, and get, huh? We let it out of the bag. We let it out of the bag. So basically, he, um, uh, he has on his record eight finishes. Seven are submissions. Five of those submissions are Japanese neckties. Now, you asked him to show him the move. This was in Stuttgart. We're in Stuttgart and uh, before his fight, and you show, he showed the move. And you broke it down as he got it. This is the last time he ever caught it. It was in Stuttgart. As he got it, you broke it down perfectly, like as in move for move, what you need to look out for, where the danger is. And ever since then, he's never caught another Japanese necktie. So, Frank Mia, you, you are joking. <laughs> you owe him a new move, okay? All right, I got it. We, I've never interviewed you. We've only sat and done the commentary. But when I sit next to you and I hear the way you break down fights, and it's not just the way you break down fights, uh, you break down mindsets as well. You really understand everything about the psychology of fighting as well as the anatomy of fighting. You're also somebody that... Um, and I've seen this, whether it's the first fight on the card or it could be the headline fight, the biggest star or the, the, the newest fighter on the card. If you see something that you haven't seen before, 
you will go to that person and you will ask them to show you the move or to break it down or have a, and I've never seen that with anybody else. What, what makes you so hungry for, for this, this knowledge? Because sometimes when people fight and it is their world and it is their universe, um, they can try and switch off from it. But for you, I've never seen you not want to know more about this, about fighting. I'm just obsessed with it. I really love it, you know, and I love all aspects of it. I think it's one of the, you know, the most baseline things a human can do. I mean, if you think about the end of the day, you know, we're cavemen, we walked outside. It's like, oh, you, you can hunt. I'm like, I know. Or you can gather. That's great. But if you can't fight, you don't get to keep any of it. <laughs> you better be able to fight because you don't get to have it. You know what I mean? Like, and so, and then just the science of martial arts, I just, I'm enamored with it, you know, as far as how mindsets go behind it. You know, what's the person's... <laughs> thinking the psychology and then just the physical application of the different techniques and then strategies and combat. I, I've just always been enamored with it. And it's, I love it. And so that's why, you know, every time I'm in hell on TikTok, it's funny. We're actually, I got my buddy in trouble because we were going through our TikToks and both our women were there and they're like looking through mine. It's like jujitsu and wrestling. <laughs> I didn't know there's an algorithm to it. Uh, all of a sudden my buddy pulls it up and it's, you know, Half naked girl, half naked girl, half naked girl, <laughs> half naked girl. And I'm like, I wonder why yours is doing that. And then the wives Googled it and they're like, oh, it's whatever you click on and you like. And like <laughs> Sorry, buddy, I didn't mean to throw you under the bus. <laughs> well, we look forward to seeing you back in there, hopefully, as well, my man. We get you back cage side to do some uh, commentary for Octagon. This time, cage side would be good, right? Not up in the rafters. Yeah, I mean, it was a good view, but I do like the energy being cage side. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and I appreciate you uh, for getting up and doing this interview, my man. And I look forward to seeing you soon, all right? Absolutely, brother. All right, man. So I've already introduced you to the lightweight champion of Octagon MMA. We've already had a, a beautiful conversation with a two-time heavyweight world champion in Mr. Frank Mir. Now it's time to introduce you to none other than Jonas Shark Magard, Octagon MMA's bantamweight champion. Now, Jonas is somebody, when I heard he'd signed with Octagon MMA, I sent a message to Pavel Neruda and Andre Novotny, and I just said to him, Josh, I said, you're going to love this kid. You're going to love it because he fights really well. He's got a great style. He's evolving as a fighter as well. Every time I see him fight, he gets better and better. But on top of that, he's got a gob on him. He can speak in the mic. He looks great, and he always takes advantage of it. Now, I want to start at Octagon 27. This is his debut in Slovakia. Now, Josh, if you could show us the uh, the walkout for that to start with, because this is somebody who has had world titles in other promotions, but this by far was the biggest stage, the biggest audience, the biggest crowd. And just look at how he soaks it up when he walks out. He is taking energy from every single one of the people in that crowd. That's confidence right there, isn't it, again? You can just see it. He oozes confidence. He stepped in and he took on Elna Viliev. Uh, now, this is a really awkward fighter as far as skill set. Strong, durable, excellent grappling. And the first round, they, the scrambles were fantastic. Now, Jonas is somebody who has got a number of finishes already on his record. I believe he's got uh, eight finishes out of his 14 professional MMA fights. Seven of those finishes are submissions, Josh. Five of those are Japanese neckties. So this is somebody that can hold his own on the ground and one of the other weapons he uses a lot within his fights is the pace is the pressure always being in the face of the opponent giving them no space to breathe and that in the end is what started to wilt uh elna Valiev. that in the end started to break him and that opened up opportunities and just look at this finish this guillotine this modified guillotine with the arm down by the side then rather across the chest he finishes it and you see Carl Prince his coach from Manchester <laughs> top team celebrating before he's even tapped Carl knew Carl knew that what, what he could do that must be his go -to, one of his go-to submissions <laughs> uh, well he actually said it in, in the corner there who, who you'll see with him is Lerone Murphy now Lerone Murphy uh, an absolute beast as well and they were saying that they were drilling that exact move I love it when that sort of thing happens we saw it last week with DD score when he was drilling the exact move he finished his opponent with but for them to have been setting that up and Jonas Jonas Magard to cinch it up in the second round what a statement that was I said it last week mate Drillers make killers. Drillers make killers. So we're now going to jump up to Octagon Prime 4. That victory, also what he said on the mic after that fight, earned him the title shot against Philip Macek. This was for the vacant bantamweight title. Now, Macek had fought for it before. Jonas Magard, only one fight in Octagon at that point. Only one fight, but looking to claim the belt in his second visit to the Octagon cage. When you look at this performance, 
I've already talked to you about how good his grappling is. Seven of his eight wins, eight finishes are by submission. His striking in this fight, and we saw how good Maciek was last week against Zelanda. You saw the spinning heel kicks. You saw the pressure, the jump knees. Jonas Magard, it was like the Matrix. He was one step ahead of Philip Maciek throughout that fight. And it was a five-round, five-round beatdown. And even Maciek at the end raised Magard's hand. That said it all. That guy knew that he'd been beaten by the better man that night. A phenomenal performance and one that saw Jonas claim octagon gold. So two fights in and he's already the octagon bantamweight champion. And we said it with Lozen Kieta, Josh. It's not just about how they fight. It's what they do on the mic and what they do around. And Jonas, again, absolute gold on the mic. Let's have a listen to him here. This is the show of Europe. And I'm the king of Europe now. So everybody who wants it can get it. They're going to get smoked. They're going to get iced. People think I only got wrestling, I got damn hands, baby. And I've not even shown 10%. And now one last thing. I don't want to see these apps for a long time after this. I want to get fat. So, we've met the light heavyweight champion last week, Carlos Vimola. We've met Lozen Kieta, the lightweight champion. Now we've just met the bantamweight champ, Jonas Magad. All these belts are now targets on these people's back. One person who's getting a lot of heat at the minute and people are speculating who will be his next opponent is none other than Jonas Magad. So, let's speak to him now. So we welcome the... The champ, the shark, Mr. Jonas Magard. How are you, brother? I'm very, very well, thank you. How are you? I'm good, my man. Listen, I've just been talking to one of your friends, one of your, uh, one, one person that was with you a while ago, before you had the belts, before you had the name and the fans, Mr. Frank Mia. Now, he said some very oh. nice things about you. And uh, how he crazy lying, is it? <laughs> <laughs> how crazy is it how far you've come when you think about you, when you were driving him around doing the seminars to now king of the hill yeah it is crazy but it's always been my plan in a way it's always been my vision to to go there i just didn't know it was going to take the, the the path that it did but that's how life is isn't it you you never you can never control it and i, I always wanted to fight for the biggest stage and and experience what i'm actually experiencing right now that was always my dream so in a way it's crazy but it's also feel natural. It suits you as well, brother. It really suits you. The big stage, the bright lights. I mean, I jump back to Octagon 27, your debut for Octagon. We've shown yeah. people the walkout. We've shown people the fight, the finish right from the start. And that's that, that for me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that's the biggest stage you've ever fought on up until Definitely. that point. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and definitely. It, it suited you. You looked like you embraced the energy rather than got scared by it. I mean, describe that experience when you, you're walking out into a crowd like that. It just, like like I just said, it just felt so natural. And I just felt like it was in my like natural habits. If you want to talk about sharks and stuff, you know. But, yeah, I just got the energy, the fans, everything. was just, It just felt right. And it, it's, it's a crazy thing because I've only experienced that once. And uh, that was my first amateur fight that I won. And after that, I just it just felt right. This is was what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And I felt a bit the same way when I was walking in for the first Octagon event. And I just felt right. And I just got the energy. And yeah, it, it was just me. You know what I mean? And I just grew from that and, and uh, performed through that as well. So on the mic after that, that's what I believe earned you the title shot. That's what I think got you the, the, the shot against Maciek. Now, that's two fights into your Octagon career. You've had belts in other promotions, but this by far the biggest. What, what were the emotions like when, when you got that fight signed? I remember you used to have the belt uh, as a screensaver on your phone, like a reminder every single day. What, what, what did it feel like to know that fight was coming? Was there a lot of pressure? Was it something that excited you? Were you scared? Any, any, anything like that? I just wanted to be the champion of Octagon because it is the greatest promotion in, in Europe, hundred by far, hundred percent. And and to see myself there, being the champion, get the belt against a guy like Philip, it, 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 it was just my destiny. I feel. But the performance, my friend, you think you talk about all that because you obviously respect. Philip Macek, he's got all those submissions. He's a lot more fights than you, almost double uh, the amount of professional mm. fights that, that you you had. Um, yet you were picture perfect. This was the opportunity we've been waiting for the last three years because I've been working on my striking. I, I teamed up with Dino, my, my, my boxing coach. So this is just the, 
opportunity we've been waiting for. All the other fights have been able to take people down, hold them down. Why would I strike with them when I was winning? Dominant. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah. this time, I didn't want to give him the chance. But now, I want to fight that guy. I want to fight Philip again. And he's been shown so good. And I want to fight him again because I want to finish him. And I want to also even just prove my wrestling against him. I want to I want to finish him. I want to prove my wrestling against him. And I want to ha- try to have a rematch. I've never tried to have a rematch before. Because even though you're fighting the same guy, you're not really fighting the same guy. You know what I mean? And what he's 100%. been showing. 100%. What he's been showing the last two fights. He's been ang- angry. He's been going forward. And that's the guy I want to fight. Because we took him a bit with the pants down last time. Because he thought we were going to wrestle with him. And we just striked with him. You know? <laughs> so... It's just one of them, but I, I want I want to fight him again. I want to I, I want to finish him. This is really a challenge for me because he's been showing different looks, and that's something I've never tried. I've been doing five rounds. I've been doing full crowds. I've been doing no crowds, uh, but I've never done a, a rematch before in my entire life, and that's something I want to put on my legacy as well. What's it mean to you to be the Octagon champ? It means everything. Uh, so I, I come from a small country first of all. And I come from an even smaller city in a small country. I think there's like 17,000 people in, the, in in that city where I grew up. And nobody have ever done or even dared to dream doing what I'm, I was doing last fight, fighting the best striker they had to offer in front of 20,000 people. And I just felt like home there. I was having a laugh walking in. You know, I was absolutely having, I was having a laugh in the fight. I was having a laugh before the fight. Like, and sometimes I have to stop myself. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, you are <laughs> mad in your head. You know, <laughs> you know? And, 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 and it is crazy to come back home and, 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 and people running after you in Prague and want to take pictures with you after the fight and all those things. And then you come back home and I swear down, my neighbors don't even know what, know what I'm doing. You wow. know, it's like, it's like such a crazy feeling, you know what I mean? Before I let you go, there's a target on your back, obviously. You are the champ. There's already people calling you out. Machek, that's talking about... Me out. Of course they are. They want the fight. They want, they want the fight with the shark. Um, Machek, of his last performance, do you think he's done enough to earn that shot? Were you impressed with, with, with that finish, especially against someone like Selanda? So impressed. You should have seen... In my home, how we were celebrating. Where where my were you as well? Was... You're usually at all the events, and we were like, know. "Where's Jonas?" I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Should have been there, shouldn't I? I was at home watching, even with my little son, I'm three years old, and we were celebrating. He was screaming like, ah, like Santa Claus was coming, you know, because I was so happy <laughs> and I want that fight so bad because I think there's a story. It's all about a story. I think the fans are, are invested in this. From my side, I have to prove myself, but he has to prove himself too. He got he gets a third t- shot, maybe, hopefully. And I have to prove myself in a rematch. I've never done a rematch before, so it's gonna be something new. And I'm not gonna go into the fight and think he's gonna come with the same thing as before. But I'm not gonna come with the same thing either. So he's definitely earned his shot. He has the story. He's he 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 he's been active. He's been fighting in octagon. I've been active. I did the boxing mats and uh, and stuff like that. But yeah, I, I think it's the fight to make. But I think it's a big fight. I don't think it's just the. I I would like the fight. I would like to wait. I want I want him. Last time he got, I only got uh, two months to prepare for him. After my fight, I fought for the title two months after. And and this fight, I, I would like to have it in, 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 in the O2 Arena the 30th of December. That's what I would like. Uh, wow. Big sold-out crowd. Make, make, for, make biggest, more history. The biggest. Yeah. Um, the two biggest. other names. The two other names I want to talk to you about. So Mick, Michael Diego Sheck, he fought Octagon 33 against Corey Tate. Now you were there at that one. And I remember you speaking mm. to me before saying you want a performance out of one of these guys so that you've got uh, like a name, a challenger that you can. You didn't seem that impressed with the way he got the victory. He's a tough opponent, Corey Tate. Mm. Is he is is he even in the mix? I don't know. He's a, he's a, he's a guy I, I, I want to fight because he's a real fighter. He's an old school guy. He's tough, an old right? school fighter, tough guy. Uh, I was devastated because I was in Frankfurt seeing the show and I was devastated that he didn't get a finish. 
like you said, when I had my first fight in Octagon, I, I, I owned my right. I owned my spot. I finished a guy who's never been finished before. You keep, you keep talking about earning the shot because there's one other guy that's been at you on social media as well. Felipe Lima, the 12 and one fighter. Uh, he put something up saying that he, he's been offered the fight or he's, you've been offered the fight. Is that a case of you, you don't think he's earned that? You don't think that's a fight that he's, he's got to climb the ladder to get to you? Is that what you're saying? Definitely. Definitely. There's, what? Who knows him in Octagon? You know what I mean? There's a story to tell. There's a story to be brought in. For me, as a guy fighting out of Denmark, yeah, I know a lot of people in, in Czech knows me now, but people also know Philip. And, and that's why I think it's the fight to make. It could be the other fight as well if he goes in and, and, and performs. But I think Philip have owned his right. He's next in line. And then we will take it from there. But I want to give him the chance to show himself it's going to be his third time he's going to fight for a title. And I want to give him the sh chance to do it in front of a sold-out O2 arena in his home country. Like, I, like I said, I am Santa Claus and I will see you in December. And I'm going to pack some he he heavy, heavy packages for him. You know, some heavy gifts, hard gifts. Nobody <laughs> likes the soft gifts, don't they? So I'm going to some hard gifts for him. My good Jonas, you are always good at dropping a promo. And I think we should finish on that because that, that for me, sells the fight. Your rise through Octagon and your evolution as a mixed martial artist has been phenomenal, my friend. Uh, great to witness what you are becoming. I'm excited to see exactly how far how this goes. Oh, well, so happy very, to talk with a you small always. part on the outside, but my goodness, I feel very honored to be at any part of it whatsoever. So Jonas Magard, our bantamweight champion, thank you for your time, and we will see you in the cage soon, I hope. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so next up, I want to show you the promo for Octagon 37 that has just dropped. Cosma versus Kike Brito. The return of the sovereign champion back home to Ostrava to the toughest city in the Republic. David Pink Panther Cosma. With five title defenses. And in the sixth, he will face perhaps the most dangerous challenge ever. The man who sent Bararosh to the ground. Richard. Oh! Andrei Kalashnik. Representing Brazil! Kike Brito. Octagon 37. December 3rd in Ostrava. Tickets available in the Ticket Portal Network. Josh, I cannot tell you how super excited I am for that fight. David Cosma, the longest reigning undefeated in the Octagon Cage, the welterweight champion, has been in some absolute wars against world-class opponents, is taking on what I believe is the most dangerous man in Octagon MMA, Kike Brito. 13 professional wins in MMA, all by knockout. 30 professional wins in kickboxing, all by knockout. Knockout. This guy, if he gets to touch your chin, you are going to sleep. That's terrifying. Terrifying. That Look at terrifying. your eyes. <laughs> Absolute. You've never even met the guy. You've never no. even seen the guy. So that's what we've got coming up. I just want to finish, Josh, before we disappear back into the ether of the internet. I want to finish on a feel-good story about one of our fighters, the light heavyweight number one contender, Stefan Putz. Now, Josh, when you go on holiday, what sort of thing do you look for? If you're going to book the most idyllic holiday for you and your lady going away, what would you pick? You know, blue blue sky, blue sea, sandy shores, sunshine. That's what I want. Manchester, basically, Manchester. right? Manchester. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but that's that's what you would book if you were Absolutely, saying, yeah, yeah, that's what you book. Stefan puts T800, the number one contender in the light heavyweight division, has taken his lady to Greece, Josh, where they are saving stray dogs. They are working with an animal shelter out there and they are going around the streets, uh, picking up, collecting these dogs, taking them to the shelter, giving them uh, medicine, uh, giving them all the, the, the vaccinations that they need so that they can be healthy, trying to rehabilitate and rehome some of them. That, my friend, 
end, whenever you talk about perceptions of fighters, when people talk to me about who steps in the cage, what sort of person does this as a career, as a job, this is one of the guys that I really try and highlight because he's a unique personality. He's one of the baddest men on the planet, yet when he has some downtime, all he wants to do is give back. That's that, how nice is that? How nice You've is that? you made me feel bad now. <laughs> There's plenty of stray dogs in Manchester, so maybe you and your missus can grab some when you go there. So once again, thank you for tuning in to Octagon Hype. We will be back with you in two weeks' time, so stay tuned. Make sure you like and subscribe to the channel. All of our social media links are below. Make sure you give us a follow, and we will see you in two weeks' time.